You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible actor. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar, this is Hear Me Out, and I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Adrian Lester. I don't know whether I've told you this before, but BBC's Hustle was <laughs> one of the first TV shows that I remember being madly and passionately in love with. And obviously it was... Back in the day when we didn't stream things, it was like no. when something was on TV, you just sat down and watched it. And I can vividly remember hurling myself at the sofa whenever the theme music started. <laughs> so your Olivier Awards and your CBE means nothing here. <laughs> means nothing. It's worthless. Means nothing. I know how to pick a pocket. That's that's. Yeah, the... <laughs> it's just your con man credentials that will earn you brownie points. <laughs> oh, well, cool. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> but from one sort of fourth wall breaking piece of entertainment to another, you want to talk today about Cost of Living, yeah. which is by Martina Mayoke. Yeah. And this was the 2018 Pulitzer Prize winner for drama. And then you were in it at the Hampstead Theatre in London in 2019. Yes, when we were still going to the theatre, directed by Ed Hall. Oh, my um, God. It was a... It was a um, I'd never worked at Hampstead before. Mm. And whenever something comes in where someone's, you know, interested in me being in a play or whatever it is, mm -mm. no matter what it is, my agent always sends it along to me. She says, look, so-and-so asked you to do this in you know a scout hall in Sheffield <laughs> do you think that and I go do you know what it's let's say nice and I know I just don't feel feel that I'm ready for that at the moment yeah and so this came along and you know as all actors are you're trying to step up to the next sort of level of notoriety and also finance and income and yeah. so on you're constantly the pushing stops. yeah the struggle never stops so after doing like Henry V and Hamlet and you know mm. Othello and Red Velvet and West End stuff this small beautiful play came across my agent's desk and she said um Ed wants to talk to you about doing this. Uh, would you would you like to meet on it? Yeah. And I got the play and I thought, well, I'll read it. And I don't think, you know, this is the next thing because I really want to do a film. Um, <laughs> and I started reading it. I couldn't put it down. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't know why. And that's yeah. a strange thing to have about a play because the play doesn't really explain itself. Mm. It sort of works on you as you listen to it, as you as you read it. And I hoped it would work on you as you watched it. So I thought, let me just, let me meet Ed. Let's go and have a chat. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we went and had a chat about it. And um, he spoke about uh, Katie Sullivan, who'd played the part three times before in America. The part of your wife. The part of my wife, sorry, who'd played the part, uh, Arnie, of, um, of my character's wife. Mm. And she was a wheelchair user and great actress and so on. And he spoke about that and he spoke about the play and what it meant and so on. And I thought, you know what, I've got to do this. Yeah. I've, just, I've just got to do this. The movies can wait. The, the movies can wait. Can wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this. You sort of, they, they yeah. say you do one for the bank, one for the soul, one for the bank, one yes. for the soul. Yeah. This was definitely one for the soul. It, it contained everything that I believe theatre should be. It was, it was mm. really honest. It was transformative. I think it shed light on a subject and characters we don't normally see on stage. And mm. yeah, it was, I loved it. I loved doing it. Yeah. I think it's so interesting to hear you say that because... I actually had a similar response when you told me you wanted to discuss this speech. And for people who don't know the play, it's the prologue, isn't it? It's the opening speech. So yes, actually, it's the opening speech, yeah. So not knowing the play myself, I, I actually didn't know it. I thought, well, okay, I can, you know, I don't need to read the whole play to understand this. It's the first thing mm. we see of the play. So, you know, I'll sit down and read the prologue, make sure that I know what Adrian and I are chatting about. And I had exactly the same experience. Oh, I sort of good. got to the end of the prologue having printed it out. And I was like, well, I don't know what happens next. Ended up opening up the PDF <laughs> on my computer again and being like, oh, okay. And, and reading sort of the first half of the play because it just had this flow. Yeah. I have to admit, like, I don't really enjoy reading plays. Mm -hmm. For someone who's in the theatre, I don't like the process of reading a play by myself. But it is really... I was about to say addictive. I don't think that's quite the right word. But, you know, you really wanted to keep investing in these people. Yeah. So can you fill us in for people who didn't get to see it or haven't read it? What is it about? 
it's about uh i'm just making a few notes here so i don't uh, go off go off into actor anecdote because because i will i will i have <laughs> oh, to please. make i have to make notes to actor keep, anecdote is exactly what we want <laughs> to keep myself um <laughs> do not censor yourself adrian this is not the place <laughs> it's not the place okay so it, it's a it's a play okay martina um martina is uh polish mm-hmm. and she she had a, a, an illness when she was um, studying in New York mm. and she became quite debilitated by that illness. I think it, I believe it was touch and go whether she was going to survive. And then after she finished her studies as a young student, she worked as a care worker. Mm. And so she observed firsthand the daily process of looking after someone who was a wheelchair user who wasn't physically able to do all of the intricate things you need to do Mm -hmm. to take care of yourself. And she did that day in, day out. And I believe for a little while she had that done for her. So she was in a kind of a unique position to understand what that felt like. Mm. It's a four-hander. The cast was Emily Barber, Jack Hunter, who has cerebral palsy and was a a wheelchair user in the play, although not in life he isn't. And Mm. Katie Sullivan, who is an actress, and she actually um, is an Olympian as well. (laughs) I read this. I was like, that is rude. That's just rude. (laughs) That's just rude. To be a brilliant actress and a Paralympian. And a Paralympian. Um, (laughs) Katie was born with no lower legs below the knee. Uh, so to say, to, I mean, she's often called an amputee, but that's not strictly correct because her legs have not been amputated. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to describe, you know, what people sort of see mm-hmm. when she's walking. She walks on blades when she's walking or mm. on um, computer controlled lower legs that are amazing. Wow. And they can sense when she's leaning, you know, what more weight on one than the other. And they sort of connect to each other via microchips. And We live in the future. She calls herself the bionic woman sometimes. So um, <laughs> it was an eye opener for me because. I'd never worked with actors who were physically challenged in that way. And um, Mm. the view of the world that the play shows you about their lives Mm. is so clear and so, so strong. And then you're in the rehearsal room with actors who are sharing stories about what that's like. Mm. And Jack Hunter's sister is a wheelchair user, although he isn't. And he said it was a real eye opener for him playing someone who could only sort of really move their wheelchair with their right hand. Mm. He said that he got a real taste of what it's like for his sister. Wow. They would speak about, you know, people, you know, one attitude on the phone and then when they meet you, they've got this other attitude and you can see them going into what I would describe as sometimes race panic where people feel they've, yeah. said, they've said something and their eyes go wide and they go, oh God, I hope we didn't hear that. When I said dark, I didn't mean, I mean, I meant, I meant mood. I meant mood, not actually. But it, you, it, you, suddenly you become aware in using language of just how language has been constructed with one point of view in mind. Oh, yeah. Not only, like, when I do a job, I have to, and I I say it's a classical text, you don't have to read very far into the classical text before you come to a bump of colour, where black is just negative and bad and horrible, and you go, um, Mm. I understand it, and it's all, you know, fine, and that's what we used to say, but now, when we know much more about our world, and our world looks very, very different, it kind of pings out at you. Yeah, absolutely. And such is the same when talking to Katie and you just have to, you know, you just have to run around with it for a bit, you know, and you just have to get it on its legs and just try and, you know, it's all these little phrases yeah, we how use interesting. without using physicality to describe a mood or a feeling rather than, you know, being more specific with our words. It's, it's a strange, strange thing to discover. So why this speech? What is so magical about this speech? Because I feel like actually when you read the prologue, I wasn't aware at that point that this was a play that was going to focus actually on disability versus able-bodied people or caring yeah none of that comes up in this prologue does it no it doesn't it doesn't at all you just the okay for firstly why the prologue the the prologue sticks Mm. out in my mind because it is one two three four (laughs) five six seven <laughs> seven pages um, i know some of them have just fallen on the floor in like a gust of a breeze in in the room i'm in um so there's seven pages of of uh i was gonna say dialogue monologue that starts the play and i would every night i would just get this these butterflies in my stomach as i was just preparing to go on and, i know. wanted to ask that i was gonna oh ask you, was it nerve-wracking God. it was nerve-wracking and mm. um i i love those little bits of our job where you you get tested mm. um i would hate to be in a job where you just sort of did kind of the same thing every single day you know that's but that's just me that's what i i, mm. I like mm. 
I need to be sort of challenged a little bit and shaken awake. <laughs> and and so I'm I'm waiting to go on uh, stage and I've got my phone in my hand and a, and a bar stool and that, that's what I had to have as my props. And I'd walk out and every night I would just launch myself into this 20 minute yeah. speech as if I'd walked into a bar and I was just talking to you know three or four people who happen to look friendly and and Eddie just mm. walks up and talks to them because he needs to talk to them but the thing is he's at, at, at that point the play flips backwards and forwards in time so at that point Arnie his wife is dead mm. he is mourning her he is he's, he's telling he's going to tell people the story of you know how it happened and why he feels so sad mm. but there's there's a note that Martina writes at the beginning of the play she says self pity is not a currency for these people. Mm. Self-pity is, a, is the worst thing. Humor is the best thing. Mm. So Eddie is incredibly sad. He's incredibly lonely. He's a recovering alcoholic. And he's desperate for a drink. He's desperate for company. And he misses his wife so much. And he feels incredibly alone. But the last thing he does in that speech is mention it. Yeah. He doesn't want to say, I feel lonely. Uh, I miss my wife. Will you please talk to me? And help me because I don't think I'm going to last very long. He doesn't say any of that. It's like everything that he doesn't say is the most important thing about yeah. the speech. Yeah. So, and I, I'm, I'm the kind of actor who spent a lot of time sort of learning how to articulate, you know, um, intricate emotions in Shakespeare sort of thing. How do I, how do I say this to make it more apparent <laughs> that I feel angry and I feel that the world is crushing? And then Shakespeare will give you lots of metaphors to say, and then the mountaintop will fall upon my soul and I will do it. Yeah. You know, all, <laughs> all this stuff to say, I'm a bit, I'm a bit peed off at the I'm moment. I'm down. I'm a bit yeah. down. But in this speech, it's in this play, it's the opposite. They do not say it. Yeah. And so the audience and a lot of people who, who had direct experience of caring for someone who became debilitated, they came to see the play and they said they've never seen that on stage. This pure, pure love mm. between these two people who, and she's left him, who can't live together, but they mm. still, still desperately love each other. Yeah, so just to clarify, at the sort of at the beginning of the timeline, at least that the play portrays, mm -hmm. Arnie and Eddie have separated, and yeah. actually the character of Eddie only goes back to care for her because she's had an accident. And he feels he is the best person to to be her carer. Is that right? Yeah, that's how he explains it to her. Right. But actually, he he loves her and he misses her. But he doesn't, again, in the play, he doesn't say it. He just says, but look, who else is going to look after you? She says, I yeah. got my nurse, I got my things, I got my, you know, I don't need you. And you're in the audience, you're sitting there thinking, yes, you do. You yeah. desperately need him and he desperately needs you. We realized that the most secure and powerful character in the play was a wheelchair user with cerebral palsy who was studying at, is it Yale? I think he's studying at Yale. Mm. He's He's really rich and he's well off. And... That character is the most secure in the play because the mm. woman who comes to care for him, Emily Barber, played by Emily Barber, she has no money. She's she's desperate for, for um, somewhere to live. She's sleeping in her car. Then you've got Arnie, who's also had her problems with drink and crashed her car because of the drink and therefore lost her lower limbs in the play. You've got Eddie, my character, mm. who's completely able-bodied. But we were in rehearsal. We were saying that actually he, his disability is in his heart. It's in his, he's in his mind. His alcoholism runs the way, all, all the way through his life. So everybody is in some way dealing with an aspect of being, having a hurdle to leap mm. as, as they deal with society, be it physical or mental, except the guy who has cerebral palsy and, and spends his life in his wheelchair. He's, yeah. the one, he's the one who's kind of like, oh, no, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. And so the audience were watching this thinking that it's so strange that there's this young, attractive woman who's coming in to look after him who is actually much more depressed and hopeless and sad yeah. than he is. We just sort of don't see that normally. Yes, yeah, I love absolutely. I that, love that about it. So going back to you saying you were nervous, what about this opening speech? Was it just the, you know, you've already mentioned this thing that it's sort of seven or eight pages long. Yeah. It can't be just the length of it that was intimidating because you've played, well, the Peterbrook Hamlet is a longer period of time alone on a stage. Surely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So what was it about it that gave you the the jitters? It sounds so simplistic to say getting it right, just getting it right. And I had to kickstart the play and make sure the audience got all the information they needed to understand the play from the mouth of a guy who doesn't express half of what he's feeling. <laughs>
Good luck. <laughs> so, yeah, so good luck. It was like walking a tightrope and was one yeah. one of the most difficult things I've done. And did you, you said about it being like a tightrope, did you have nights where you felt you walked it beautifully and nights where you fell off? Like, could you feel a difference? Could you feel the sort of minutiae having an impact? Yeah, I could feel those tiny changes having an impact on the audience. And sometimes you had audiences that didn't didn't get it. Mm. They didn't know what it was. And some some audiences, you walk out and you, you look at them and you begin to chat and they just get scared. Mm. They go right back in their seat and go, no, 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 he's talking to me. Yeah, no, you can see it. it's going gonna, it's gonna to make fun of one of us. One of us is going on stage. Something bad's going to happen. And, <laughs> and people get fearful. Yeah. And there were some nights where I came out and I began and the audience would right there, r- leaning forward, listening to every single word. And you could tell... When I hit a conclusion of a thought, there would be this mm. little reaction, a little intake of breath or a little <laughs> a little release. Something that just said, oh, you're you're really listening to everything I say. So it's going to be this is going to be easier today. Yeah, it was a, an, an interesting run. Sometimes the matinees, a lot of actors get through the matinees because they've got another show to do in the evening. Yeah. But the matinees were some of the most powerful performances because the matinees are normally you're playing to an older crowd in the theater Mm, mm. and in these matinees because we were dealing with human frailty and love Mm. and loss Mm. i suppose simply because of the age the words were more poignant to that age of audience than a younger audience in the main and uh, the the matinees were a lot of the matinees were quite powerful we actually had exactly the same thing with joe egg i remember thinking it was the only time that i've ever done a play where like the matinees were something i almost looked forward to more they seemed to land they seem to land a bit more. Mm. But yeah, I guess it's the age old problem or challenge as an actor is like, even if you can feel that the audience isn't maybe giving you what you wanted them to, you've just got to carry on. You've got to trust the process. Yeah, trust the process. And... Just do the speech as you'd planned to do it, you know, and not try and veer off to please. There's, the, I often get that feeling of being like, oh, you don't like me today and <laughs> what can I do to please you? And then it just ends up being crap. Why didn't so. they laugh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why don't you love me? It shows you that, that silence isn't a bad thing. Silence is just you know them concentrating and you think, I didn't get that laugh. You think, no, they're just, they're just listening. They're just listening. Absolutely. So actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Talking of silence, one of the things that struck me when I was reading the prologue was the extent to which Martina uses punctuation or not Mm. and Mm -hmm. line breaks. Like it's very like to see this prologue on the page, it looks like a poem almost. You know, she shifts lines so frequently. How did you find that? Did it feel like a real sort of guiding hand? Uh, It was... Terrible, (laughs) (laughs) because um, you mentioned poetry, but just like poetry, it's a lot of disjointed thoughts and non sequiturs just following on from each other. So I had to. Oh, this is going to sound so terrible. I had to learn the music of it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Rather than the um, the beautifully written progressive lines of thought, you know, every every thought completed before moving on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. He speaks. Just like, you know, you do in real life, I suppose. Yeah. He'll set up a, a clause. He'll go, I mean, the first time I was on the bus, it was just, it was terrible because, you know, see, I like to go for a walk. <laughs> and, and you're just going, what about the bus, man? We're finishing the thought of the bus. And when I'm out for a walk, you know, I saw this guy and this guy had a dog and dogs. Don't you love dogs? Dogs are just these kind of, and you start, I start going, what? Where am I going? And then he'd go back and suddenly he'd finish off the story about the bus. Which is how real people speak. Which is how real people speak. But learning that was a nightmare. So I had to learn, I had to learn, I put this speech in my headphones. I read it through and put it in my headphones. And I had it playing daily for about a week, um, two Mm. weeks before we started rehearsals. So that by the time I walked into rehearsals, this speech was learnt. I didn't want to spend any rehearsal time trying to learn the lines. But we had we had a, we had about three sessions on it just to get to get it right. But the words the words I had down. Yeah. How did your understanding of it change? You know, you say you had a few sessions on it when you first read it and when you learnt it. Obviously, did your understanding of what was going on change radically? Yeah, it did because um, because of Ed Hall. Really, he would look at me and and just say, "Okay, too much, pull back." Mm-mm. I know what you mean. Too quickly, which is. It's something that I do a lot. I like to think that I've got lots of tools and I can bring them all out (laughs) to show and to, you know, fill a character out. And Ed would sort of go, 
okay, yeah, too many tools. In, in some ways, it was the inflection was too clear. Yeah, this has got to be a discovery yeah, for the let, audience. Almost. Make me work. Don't hand it to me on a plate. Yes. So, which is, of course, I think more in keeping with what Martina meant. And it is that really. You, you, he never once says, "I'm sad. I'm lonely. Please help me." Yeah. But you see it all the way through until he gets to the end and he's just, you know. Well, I was about to say, I sort of love that he he keeps offering to buy people drinks, doesn't he, during yeah. the speech. And the final word of the speech is please. Yeah. I think, Who's this poor guy? Yeah. The section I've, I've chosen to read doesn't get into all of that, but because uh, it's a really nice story about texts. Mm, mm. Can I say what that is? Shall I say what that yeah. is? Yeah. I'll say what it is. Yeah. But <laughs> in, <laughs> In the, in the speech, he Eddie is telling you this, you know, story. He says, signs are real. And he's telling you this story of how when he was on the road, he would get these texts from his wife when he was in hotel motel rooms and so on, just driving these long distances. Mm. And he's, in, he's on his own in the motel room and the thoughts would start to pull him down. And it was at that point he would always reach for his drink. And he mm. talks about how his wife would text him at those points. Arnie would text him and say, hey, how you doing? And it would just pull him up. Yeah, yeah. And then after she she died, he then texts her on her number that he's got in his phone. Hey, how you doing? I was thinking of you. Put put in a good word for me with Jesus. You know those kind of <laughs> things. So he's trying to make light of the fact that he's missing her so much. He's texting her. And then one night, his phone goes bzz, and he gets a text from her number. Mm-mm. And he said he freaked out. And at which point he's telling, yeah, he's telling the audience, listen, I'm not stupid. I know this isn't my wife. OK, just so, yeah. so we can clear that up. She's this isn't dead. a ghost story. This yeah. isn't a ghost story. This is not my wife. But, you know, it's maybe it's a, hey, it's a, you know, it's a thing. And yeah. It's a thing. So because it's a thing, he texts back, you know, hi. And the person says, where are you? And he goes, uh, home. <laughs> and this person says, I'm in a bar in Williamsburg. Do you want to come over kind of thing? So he goes, okay. And that's the bar that he starts the speech in at the beginning of the play. So that and he, and he describes how he got there. But he gives you a, a real sense of his life as he, as he does. It's a beautifully written speech. And, you know, it's, it's a part that I was so lucky to play. Well, then... Shall we hear it? Is it time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've had a lovely chat about it. All right. So this this is just like I think about three minutes taken from the the middle of this uh, of this uh, opening monologue. Okay. Signs are, are real. Uh, this I know because you see I used to drive trucks cross country. Loved it. Loved every aspect of the job. The scenery, you know, every aspect. Oh, the fucking scenery. <laughs> Utah, Jesus age, man. Utah's gorgeous and no one even knows. <laughs> but then but then I got popped for a DUI. Yeah. In a car. Blocks from home. Lost my CDL. Oh, Shit's Creek. So, you know, I got the memories and some unemployment. <laughs> but that life is good for people. I, I was thankful for every day they ain't invented yet the trucker robots. <laughs> yeah, that life is good. The road, sky, the scenery, yeah. uh, except the loneliness. Yeah. Yeah, except in the case of all the, you know, loneliness. See, see, this is what this was what my wife was good for. Uh, not that this was the only thing, you know? <laughs> but you know, everyone what's married, there's, uh, you know, the, the fuck days, yeah? like, fuck, what did I do? <laughs> like, what did I actually fucking do here? Because, <laughs> you know, y y you married a person and a person's going to be a person even if they're married. Hey, that's a lesson. That that's a lesson for your life right there. But still, I I still you still loved her. You know. <laughs> she she would text me uh on the road at night in motels, which alone can be you know, can drum up certain feelings. Mm. This is why there's Bibles in motels. We're, we're, we're all of us in motels on the road to somewhere we ain't at yet. And that makes us feel feelings. Roads are dark and America's long. 
And I mean, this wasn't poetry, these texts. <laughs> this wasn't like, you know, uh, 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 you know, poetry. Is thinking of you, <laughs> uh, how's things, your check came today, uh, off to bed, good night. <laughs> Uh, that little buzz in my pocket or on the nightstand, that's the rope gets tossed down to you at the bottom of that well when the thoughts come. You know, the thoughts, that loneliness. <laughs> the texts, they're like, climb on up out of there, you know? <laughs> they're like, uh, get up out of those thoughts, you know? <laughs> Cause, uh, cause thinking of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That just put the biggest smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's lovely that he, he spends so long trying to, trying to entertain the people that he's with. Yeah. You feel it. You know, you want to smile along with him. You, you yeah. want to sort of go along, like help him tell his story. I completely agree. Ed brought that up in rehearsal. He said that there's something, we sort of look at you with a bit of disbelief, mm. and which is, which is nice for the part because we always judge people by, you know, how they look and how they seem. And so when we look at this person who's obviously very warm, obviously very, you know, likable, we ca it can't compute that that person could feel so lonely. Yes, that's interesting. That's part of the, part of the puzzle. And I had, a, I grew a beard for the and let my hair grow for the part and uh gosh you know i spent lucy i spent ages putting little flecks of gray in it little flecks of gray <laughs> just to make myself look a bit older uh, you are so uh, committed some say it was natural gray but you know no, I, no, I, no, no. I put it in every single night I put it in. <laughs> um but uh so um, i've got this huge beard and, and this hair and then i had to go and do a reshoot on a part that i've done previously Mm. which was a sort of like, I think about a, a, a week before the end of the run. And so I go off and I have my hair completely cut and tidied and sharpened up. I have, I go completely clean shaven. And then I come back to continue the run. And it just felt wrong. You yeah. Know, Katie took one look at me and went, this is just, no, this is weird. That's not him. Yeah. It actually felt really bad because I looked like someone who'd got up and shaved that morning and had tidied their hair and really took care of their appearance. And that just isn't the guy. No. It completely broke the reality of it for a bit. So anybody who saw that performance, I apologize for not being hairy. <laughs> I should have been hairier. <laughs> And uh, I apologize for my lack of hair, but I hope you still got the play. <laughs> Those little details make such a difference, don't they? They do. They do make such a difference. There have been parts where I've been given fake nails and <laughs> not that an audience can really even see the nails from where they are. But actually, for me and for the other people I'm on stage with, it's like the difference in the way that you carry a thing or that you pick something up or yeah, that changes, you yeah. touch a person changes when you've got these little daggers on the end of your, it, yes, of your yes, fingers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> when I was doing Rosalind, I grew my um, nails long and it did... It's a wonderful it, sentence to hear you say. <laughs> <laughs> when I played Rosalind, um, when I played one of the best parts ever written for a woman on stage, um, <laughs> I, I grew my nails long and it completely changed the way I used my hands. It softened my wrist. Yeah. And then my elbow went in as I used my hands, because I had to be careful not to... Yes, you almost have to pat things front on, don't you? You have on, to use the pads, you? <laughs> of your, pads of your fingers, which actually yes. tucks, your nail, tucks your elbows yeah. in. Yeah. Well, Adrian, this has been absolutely delightful. Oh, cheers, cheers. This it's been great been talking so to you. lovely. <laughs> lovely talking about a play of a morning. And thanks for introducing me to it. Oh, brilliant to talk to you. Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast. Music composed by Tristram Kay and artwork by Rebecca Bright. If you've enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe. And I know it's a mini faff, but if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a rating and a review would mean the world. Finally, you can find us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out, and we're on YouTube, where you can catch visual clips of the show. Right, that's it. Lucy Eaton, exiting stage left. Mm -hmm.